Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming along. This is the session. If this isn't what you're expecting, then feel free to wander. But if it is, then for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to talk about some of my experiences with teams, healthy and otherwise, and some of the things I've learned along the way. It's also going to be some of the key slides retweeted by We Are Convivio. Uh, that's the Twitter uh, handle there. So if there's any points you particularly want to pick up on, they could well be on there. And then the video will be live on the DrupalCon website at the end of the session, within a couple of hours. Uh, and this is part of the Being Human track. I first of all want to just take a moment to congratulate the Drupal Association for having this track and to thank Emma, who ran this track so brilliantly. It's a really great addition to Drupal and a really good part of improving the culture that we have in the community and the companies. And um, I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by healthy teams. I don't mean perfection. There, there just isn't any such thing in teams. Where you have a group of human beings working together towards something, we are, sadly, all imperfect creatures. Healthy teams are about recognizing that and replacing it instead with this kind of approach. Instead of constantly expecting perfection, what we expect from team members is listening, understanding, thinking, forgiveness, and learning. This culture is really important, but it's really hard, really hard. There's probably not one single person in this room, including me, who is perfect at that. But let, remi let me remind you, it's not about perfection. This is what we're working towards. Now, if this was a TED talk, or I was a kind of top management consultant or something, this would have a handy acronym. Unfortunately, I'm not. So the acronym is LUTFL. So remember that if you can. But listening, understanding, thinking, forgiveness, and learning are what's key. Now, those are kind of the underlying principles. But the steps towards healthy teams that we're going to work through today are these. I'm going to have to go pretty quickly, as you can tell. But we're going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about purpose, being real people, self-managing, communication, problem solving, pulse and momentum in a team, and continuously improving. These are some of the elements that make up the idea of healthy teams. Let's start with leadership. This is how it used to be very traditional company. You've got the leader at the top, you've got some of the senior staff, and they manage the teams. And uh, instructions come down, reporting goes up, and that, that works perfectly, doesn't it? That, uh, you mean that doesn't work perfectly? Of course it doesn't. This was devised you know, in the 1920s for um, manufacturing, where they developed this idea of the production line. It was revolutionary. It was changing business. People just needed to do repetitive tasks, same thing again and again, and products would roll out. And all management had to do was sit at the top and perfect those bits of the process and tell the low-paid, low-skilled people down at the bottom, do that, do that, do that, do that faster, do more of that, do that faster. And that's all that, that needed to happen there. And then they would monitor the statistics going up. But the organizations that we run aren't production lines. They're just not that kind of business. The organizations that we run are creative teams. What we hire people for are their skills and their experience, not their ability to constantly and rapidly repeat exactly the same thing, minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day. This management structure no longer works for creative teams. And the pain we feel in this industry is in large part down to trying to force creative work into this management structure. Instead, management is more like this these days, leadership. And uh, what that means is we've got this. This is the organization or our team. And I want to make clear, actually, in, in this session, that I'm not just talking about company leadership here. I'm talking about team leadership. This could be on projects. And leadership isn't down to only one person all of the time. And I'll come on to that in a moment. But what you have here is the team or the organization as the one big circle. 
And you've got the client on the outside who's coming along to this team and saying, hey, I've got problems. Can you help me with them? And the whole team is providing the solutions back. Now, who in an organization like this is closest to the client? Who knows most about what the client problem is and what the client's circumstances are? It's the people on the perimeter, the people doing the day-to-day -day work with clients who know the most. And if we've hired smart people, grown-up people, responsible people, caring people, then we should just get out of their way and let them do what they need to do. And that perimeter is the closest point to the client, and we need to have as many decisions happening there as possible. But on the other hand, the organization needs some glue. The organization needs to be held together. This perimeter needs to be defined. You know, what is our organization and what isn't it? And that's part of the role of leadership. But leadership is also there for coaching, development, support, and so on. So just like you have a client on the perimeter coming with problems and solutions, you have the team here who may have questions and want answers, or they may have feedback or ideas to change the organization. And sometimes they request help from the leadership, from the center of the organization. It's not the top, it's the center. But other times, because leadership isn't the job of any one person, people need to move into that center. And that can be anyone in the organization. And that can be for a project basis, it can just be for a small task. And what I'm going to talk about today is how whatever level you're at in your organization, you have some power to change it, even if you don't think you have. Leadership is a mantle to be taken on by those who want to bring about change. Be the change you want in your organization, and your organization will steadily change. Convince others around the perimeter, and the organization will steadily change. Be the change that you want. Take on some level of leadership. It can be a very small level, but it makes a real difference. So once you have leadership, you need purpose. And that's one of the key jobs of the leader, is helping the team define what the organization is and what its purpose is. And one of the things that we've developed for building up our small little organization and team is this idea of a, a pyramid of purpose. And it's the things that build up in the layers. You don't have to have exactly this number on each level, but it's roughly that you're probably more likely to have values. And I'm sure we've all in organizations seen this kind of defining the values and how we're going to work together. It's collaboration or whatever it is. Those will be specific to your organization, working up towards purpose on the top. But there's a couple of things I'm going to pick out here about how to define them. And remember, this applies not just to the whole organization, but also to project teams. So think about this as something that you could perhaps sit down on a big project and work through with clients, all as one team. Your team, the client's team, round one table, collaborating on defining this, and then reviewing it every few sprints. How are we doing on this? Now, the values are the way the organization behaves and the team members within it behave. The motivations are, um, I think it's important to get to the underlying thing of, of why we're doing this. So the values are the way we behave. The motivation is why we're doing this. And when we were defining our little organization, this is what we came up with for the four motivations. These were the things why we were going to go to work every day, why we were going to do the projects we were doing. Um, and we can sense check ourselves against this on a regular basis to see how we are doing in this direction. But understanding that motivation is key, and also surfacing it. Because if you don't have this conversation, you end up with people in the organization with different motivations. If when you're bringing people together, you have this discussion, you will find that someone says, oh, actually, I don't want that. I just want to get paid, go home, watch telly. Or I just want to, I'm only earning money to save up so I can do a round the world trip, or whatever it is. So it's, a, it's worth having this conversation, really important. So these are the motivations, why we're doing what we're doing. Then you build up to the focus. Now, you may ask at first, how can you have three focuses? But focus is a triangulation, because successful organizations have such a key focus on what it is that they are going to do, that it can be so precisely specified by triangulation points. So 
by focusing on this and that and that, this is where we're aiming. Sometimes this bit is really difficult to describe. It's really difficult to capture. But if you can think of three things to focus in on, one might be a sector that you're going to work in. One might be a way in which you're going to work. One might be a technology or an approach to work. So those three things can really help you find that center point. So bringing it back together, you end up with this pyramid building up, and then your ambitions. So if these are our focuses, and this is the way we'll behave, and this is why we're doing it, what are our big ambitions? And there are two here, because it's good to have an external ambition and an internal ambition. So you know, how do we want to change the outside world? How do we want to improve things there? And what are we going to do there? What's our big ambition? And it could, could be something massive, or it could be something achievable in the next few years. And internally, what's our ambition for our organization, for our team, or for our project team? What are the ambitions there? And then those mount up so that on top you have this core purpose. What is the one thing that your organization can be the best at in the world and really, really focused on? And for your projects, why are you doing this? What is the big overriding purpose? And it's really important to have that discussion. This is how we did it for ours. Um, uh, it's small print, but the slides will be up later on. And you can see just how we built up from the bottom. And we're actually leaving the top two for now because we're going through a full branding exercise. And those we wanted to define through a process of evolution. We didn't want to just sit in a meeting room and say, yeah, that's what they're going to be. We wanted to discover them through conversations with clients and so on. So that's what we've defined there. So that's purpose. So you have leadership, you have purpose. But next, you need to allow people to be real people. And that, in so many organizations, is very difficult. Particularly if you're in a very large corporate and you're a small project team, it can be very difficult to get your team to be real or for you yourself to be real. And what does it mean? I mean, first of all, you've got to be open and frank. You've got to be able to raise those problems, things that you're unhappy about, things you think are wrong. You've got to just say what's on your mind. You've also got to be free to be weird. I think that's an important part, particularly in creative teams. It's OK to be a bit weird. It's OK to express yourself and uh, be a bit random. And if you look around some healthy organizations, you find some really weird people. And they're great. I like the weird people. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, they like me being weird too, but it doesn't always. Um, so you then need to get to know each other properly. I'll talk a bit more about this in a moment. But it's not enough just to, you know, when you bring a team together or an organization together or recruit someone onto a team, just go, oh, hi, yeah, this is Frank, this is Sue, tea's over there, kitchen's there, et cetera, et cetera. That's not enough. You need to get to know each other properly. Then you need to appreciate the differences. And those differences are vital because a team is, you know, really is the sum of its parts. And you want as many differences brought to the team as possible. Diversity is so important. And within that, Equality is good, sameness is bad. Equality does not equal sameness. Okay, equality equals everyone being treated fairly, everyone having equal opportunities. You should not try and force everyone to be exactly the same. And that's not just in terms of their skill set or their clothes or whatever it is. It's in terms of the way they express themselves, the things that make them happy and unhappy. You have to allow that to come through and value that for what it brings to the team. Then sharing thoughts and feelings. I know, soft stuff. But it's DrupalCon, it's the being human track. This is vital. And too often in the tech industry, it's like, no, just got to get it done. Don't talk about how you feel, whatever it is. Just got to get it done. Um, and actually, what you can surface here is some really important stuff here. When people are feeling a bit unhappy about something, it's often a precursor to a bigger problem that's coming down the line. Different people have different gut feels, different radars. And if they're a bit unhappy, if they want to share that, that can be really important to the success of the project and the success of the organization. And remember this thing we talked about at the start, the culture of listening, understanding, thinking, forgiveness, and learning. Practice what you preach. Take that back to your team and just think all the time, how can I listen more to what's going on in the team? How can I make sure that I'm understanding different people's viewpoints? How can I, I'm going to take myself away and have some quiet time to think and reflect on that Maybe read around it or uh, try and understand it more. And then forgiveness. Because remember that thing, there is no perfection. 
So there'll be times you get really wound up with someone on your team. That is normal. Sameness bad. <laughs> um, it's, it's, going, it's natural to get annoyed. So what you do is you express that, and you look for ways that you can come to a forgiveness of each other and make that work. And then all the time, what can you learn, what can you improve in your team and in the organization? So I want to talk a little bit more about getting to know each other properly. Um, in our team, when we first got together, one of the first things we did was uh, to just pair up and have a conversation about what kind of person we are, what mattered to us, what we liked, what we didn't. And then we drew each other. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> so I have a beard, a small beard. I like to write, I have the pen and paper, and I'm not a morning person, so I'm in my dressing gown. <laughs> so uh, that was a brief expression, but it was just a fun way of getting the conversation going. But it was the precursor to doing something a little bit more, which was a bit of a map of what are our work skills. And this is someone else in the team prepared mine. And talking amongst themselves, it's, well, what is what's he good at? What's he not so good at? How are we going to use those skills within the team? And that's a starting point just mapping out what are people's strengths and weaknesses and so on. What are they good at? And what are their specialisms? But I want to take that a bit further. Uh, and we haven't done it yet, but I want to take it further in something called personal mapping. And if you Google, you can find out lots of other people's personal maps. It's a common thing. But it's essentially like a mind map, where you get to know somebody through uh, m talking with them and mapping out a mind map of what they're like. So, you know, talk about their life dreams and goals, talk about their work skills, interests and goals, talk about their leisure and personal interests. You know, who knows, some new recruit comes in and you show them the existing team's personal maps and get them to map out theirs as one of the first tasks. You go, oh, right, you like so-and-so too. Oh, we like this. Why don't you come and join in with that? And you just instantly help people uh, become a more cohesive team. What do they love and hate? What's their style of working? Um, you know, there's all sorts of little weird niggles that people have about, oh, I hate it when people do this, or I love it when people do that. Um, and what more can you think of? So maybe with your team, one of the takeaways is to go back and think about doing this kind of personal map. How could you express yourself and make it so that people can get to know each other through talking about their interests and, and what motivates them and so on? because it all adds up towards allowing people to be real people. And that is really important. So you've got leadership, you've got purpose, you've got real people on the team who you're allowing to be real people. Then you need to set them a bit freer, and it's self-managing that's the name of the game. Now, this is so important because you've hired these smart people, you've hired creative people, you've hired adults, I presume, you know, uh, but um, th the thing is then, why do you put so much micromanagement in an organization? Why do you tie their hands with so many rules and forms and whatever else? Why do you make them get permission for even the tiniest of things? Set them free. Create a culture of self-managing. And what you'll find is an organization that takes responsibility, team members that take responsibility for supporting each other, for looking after each other. And it bonds a team together so tightly that they can weather even the largest of problems, because they are addressing them together. Now, how do you do this? Well, first of all, you plan everything together. There's not the concept of the leader going and sitting in a darkened room and going, right, what am I going to tell everyone to do? That, ju that just doesn't work. You plan together and you plan very openly. Transparency of key information is important because if you're going to expect people to make decisions like about when they're going to take holiday, how much holiday they're going to take, what expenses they're going to spend on, what conferences to go to, uh, what they're going to buy for the team, what they're going to buy for the client, what they're going to do, etc., then they need to have the information at their fingertips that you would have as a leader if you were making the same decision. That means opening up the finances. The team should know what's going on. How can you make some kind of dashboard available? It means opening up other key data, pipeline, things like that. What can you open up about to make your organization very transparent, radically transparent? Because that will also bind the team together. Then, this is often the most difficult one, making problems very visible and solving them together. It's a very human thing when something's going wrong or there's uh, some kind of big stress in the organization, 
to kind of put it under the carpet and go, well, I'm sure it'll be all right in a month or two. I don't want to just have to raise it and have a big conversation and all that sort of thing. Uh, but it just grows that way. You have to make problems visible amongst the team and solve them together because you have the power of these multiple brains and different backgrounds, different experiences, and you can make the most of that in your organization if you allow it to be free and the team solve problems together. And then put, you know, take all the decisions that a manager would make in an organization. How can you make those decisions by peer review instead? Why do you need a manager always? Why do you have to wait for someone to be available to get permission for this, that, or the other? So one of the really powerful things to do is say, well, look, for something that's a really small expense, just sort it out yourself. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. You know, just sort it out. But for something bigger, talk to any sensible colleague. Any sensible colleague, and if they approve, then that's it. Because as long as they know, the key information, they can make key decisions. And they have to have that available to them. So peer review is something we find works really well. That's also partnered with the buddy system for support and growth. So whenever any, anyone joins, we buddy them together with somebody. Um, and they then um, uh, take the time on a regular basis, every couple of weeks, to just talk stuff over. How are things going? What have you been working on? What have you learned this week? What's a problem that you're facing uh, on a regular basis? And if something comes up, they can talk about it then, one-on-one. -on -one. And it's just a very safe place where you can just vent if you need to, or boast if you want to, and just have someone who understands you and has worked with you for a while and can make it happen. Then um, another important thing is working out loud. If you're going to be a self-managing team, everybody needs to know what everyone else is doing because otherwise you're in the dark. So everyone all the time, whenever they're starting on, you know, deal, doing a particular feature or issue or something in a meeting, whatever, just be chatting about it in the chat channel. Just have one place where people know they can go and find out whatever's going on in the organization. Work out loud, say what you're working on, say when you've finished, say what's going well, and just the maximum communication possible. Micromanagement kills self-management and teams. And um, so many agencies have got into this um, overdoing time tracking. And it's a whole different subject, but really agencies shouldn't be selling by the hour these days. It's just not a productive way of working. But so many of them have these incredibly over-the-top time tracking systems, where it's in six-minute blocks, or it's this, or it's 15-minute blocks. And you've got all these categories you've got to choose from, and so on. And it drives people nuts. It's, it really drives people nuts. How can you free them up from that and still have that relationship with clients and be selling by the days or be selling the value or by the sprints or whatever and release people from this time tracking burden? So that's self-managing. Um, communications is uh, the next thing. And I mentioned it briefly there, but it's um, really, really key to consider communications actively. Too often in organizations, they kind of happen passively. Um, you know, it's just, oh yeah, that meeting will happen and this will happen and blah, blah, blah. And you don't really think through what your communications are at all and have the principles and you don't make the most of them. I know it's all too easy. Um, and so in person and on the wall is a really key thing. If you are gonna get together, and this is vital even for distributed teams. We're a distributed team, but we get together for a whole day every two weeks. And we just co-work together. Sometimes we have a workshop session together, whatever it is. But every two weeks, we're together. If you're in the same office, it's even easier. But you have these kind of sessions where either you're doing a retrospective or you're doing a planning for the next quarter or whatever it is. Do it on the wall. Make it very visual. Make it active. Have people moving around. And as well as being very visual for in-person meetings, have some core principles. What are um, your core principles for meetings? You know, are they defined? Do people know what to do? For us, it's things like showing up on time is late. Because if you show, if a meeting's at four, you show up at four, then you've got a bit of time getting your laptop open, etc., etc. Show up in time for the meeting to start at four. You can get all the chit chat out of the way first, have a coffee, etc. On time is late. Then also, every meeting has to have someone who's leading it. Even if it's you know, just a team thing, someone is leading the meeting. 
making sure that there's a structure, making sure there's a time box, making sure the meeting is productive, make sure different people are getting their chance for their voices. And there's other meeting culture things as well, meeting principles. But what would yours be? Perhaps you as a team could define what your meeting principles are. How are you going to make meetings better for everybody? Because all too often in agencies, I hear people say, oh, I've got to go to another meeting. Oh, meetings. I'll tell you something, in the creative industries, meetings are one of the things we do because they're a key form of communication. If you heard your surgeon say, oh, I've got to go to the bloody operating theatre again, oh, God, then you'd be a bit worried. What we do is meetings. We meet with clients. We meet with each other. That's where we catch up on information. That's where we share things. That's where we make key decisions and we plan. Meetings are key to what we do, not an annoyance that gets in the way. So make them work. In terms of other forms of communication that we've covered in person, also virtual meetings. Has anyone ever had that Google Hangouts thing of, oh, your microphone's not working. Can you hear me? Can you? Oh, no, I, I can't hear you still. Try another browser. Everyone has that, Skype or Hangouts or whatever it is. So have the same principles. Start early, get that figured out. Have everyone have the same headset or speaker or something like that. What are the things that you can do that will just make virtual meetings work better for you? Um, I've even done things where I take an iPad along to a meeting where one person is going to be on a virtual meeting and put them at the end of the table in an actual place so that people turn to speak to them and they can have a, a person's eye view of the meeting. Um, and just think, what can you do to make a virtual meeting more productive as well? One of the things we do is, because we're a distributed team, we put more effort into this, but you can do the same in an office too, is the tea break culture. Maybe it's just an English thing, but we like tea breaks. You know, it's good to have a cup of tea and a biscuit. And it's a great chance just to relax with your team, relax with your colleagues, catch up, talk about other stuff. And that's where serendipity happens when you've got a couple of people who get together and have a cup of tea. So we're distributed, so or free range as we call it actually. Um, it's, uh, and we just say in the chat channel, hey, I'm going to put the kettle on. Does anyone fancy a tea break in five minutes? And we just get on for the length of our cup of tea, have a chat and a catch up. And it really helps that team spirit, really helps bonding together. And on that note, chat channels, whether it's you know, Slack, Hip Chat, Skype, whatever you use to chat to others, Think about how you do it. How can you make it more effective? What are the principles that you're going to do there? Because having a healthy team, that constant day-to-day -day communication is key to it. And so do it consciously, mindfully, rather than just doing, oh, randomly, whatever I feel like. Key one for us is eating together. We're a company that's all about kind of good food, good times, getting around a table together. But actually, it's really important for human beings generally particularly when you're celebrating something or there's a big milestone, whatever it is, get together, whether it's just lunch or dinner, and hey, tech industry, we could try something other than pizza. It'd be revolutionary, you know, get imaginative and do something nice. I've had, you know, team round to mine for, and cooked dinner, that kind of thing. So do whatever it is that works for your company and your culture, but get together, share a meal, talk about stuff. And that leads on to this final one, appreciating and celebrating. It's not just enough to just do the same thing day in, day out, and you know, just on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. You have to take that time to stop, recognize what people are doing, appreciate it, and actually thank them. And one of the things that um, my colleague Joe Baker came up with is, you know what, these days all that comes through the post box is bills. Wouldn't it be nice every now and then just to get a thank you card or something? So one of the things that we've started doing ad hoc, there's no sort of schedule, is just when something good happens, just get a card, send a card, and say thanks. And do you know how nice it is in the morning to pick that up for the doormat and just go, oh, someone actually went to one of those old, old style post boxes. It's better than an email, and just think of what you can do for appreciation and celebration. So you've got all of those elements leading towards problem solving. Spoiler alert, there will always be problems. Remember that thing I said at the beginning? There's no perfection. There really isn't. Even in a team that's worked together well for a long time, problems will come up. Problems will come up day to day. That is what we do. We are problem solvers. So we need to do it within our own teams as well as for the clients. 
So if there are going to be always problems, why do we tend to wait until they come up and then just randomly go, ah, oh, and generally when it's too late, go, oh, God, we've got to do something about it. We must have a meeting. What you should be thinking about is how can we actively seek out those problems at an early stage, and what are we going to have as a framework for dealing with them? So these are the seven steps. And first of all, you have to actively gather problems. It's not just enough to wait until something comes up as a big problem. You have to actually, actively gather it. And that means perhaps you have regular meetings. Maybe you're having retrospectives, and you're gathering problems that come up there. Maybe you have in your weekly team meeting, what problems have we encountered this week? and raise those. Maybe it comes out of the buddy system. And this isn't just problems in the way the team works. It can be really small things, like you know, we need a better way of um, you know, holding this kind of meeting, or you know, we find that it's really difficult to get this client to do retrospectives, or whatever it is. Raise it as a problem, then you study it. You look into it. Well, what might be the root causes of this? You dig down into it. Then you generate multiple ideas. Well, how could we address those root causes? You select a couple of ideas that look likely, you test them, you then review those tests, and what's worked, you adopt as your standard practice across the organization. So if you think about this, that's just the agile process, isn't it? You're just working through. You're looking at what's going on, you're planning, you're testing stuff out, you're prototyping, and you're learning, and then you're adopting it and deploying it to production. So that's all part of building towards a pulse and a momentum in the organization. Because it's not enough just to have that cycle of projects. You also feel that you need to build somewhere. And I don't know if you've ever felt in your agency that it just feels like it's that relentless. Oh, we've finished this project for this client. Now we've got to go on to this project for this client. Now we've got to go on to this project for this client. But how is the organization developing? How is the team developing through that? It feels relentless. It feels like you're on a treadmill. And you know, where is the end in sight? So if you can have a pulse to your business and that feeling of momentum, it can feel like your organization is making more progress. And maybe it already is, but people just don't recognize. But that pulse. So one of the things that we take as an approach is we work on a quarterly basis. And at the beginning of each quarter, we define what our big rocks are. Now, has anyone ever seen the talk by Stephen Covey about where he puts different rocks in a jar? I don't know if anyone has, but it, what he does, he takes a couple of two jars, and he's got a pile of big rocks, a pile of smaller rocks, and a pile of gravel. And what he shows is that if you start with the gravel, all the little small jobs that need doing, all the little bits and pieces, and you put that gravel in the jar, and then you take the medium-sized rocks, and then you put them in the jar, then you come to put the bigger rocks in, and there isn't room because you know, it's all kind of pack compacted together. But if you start with the big rocks, put those in, they all fit in. The medium-sized rocks, they all fit in, and they fall among the big rocks. And then the gravel, and it pours in amongst all the cracks. All the little jobs fit in amongst everything else. So if you don't take those big rocks and put them into your planning first, for your team or your organization, then they don't happen. They don't get done. And you don't get that feeling of forward motion, of momentum. So we start each quarter with the big rocks. What are the, you know, we tend to have about three things. What are the three things that must happen this quarter to make us feel that our business has momentum? And we make sure those are done in the quarter. And we have a monthly review of all of those. What actions have been done towards them? What need to be done? What can we schedule in? So that is the pulse. It's the quarterly to monthly. And then that falls down to a we weekly thing. We have management Mondays, where a couple of us get together and just work through all the smaller tasks. So it's big rocks, smaller rocks, gravel. And you work through that pulse. What is your organizational pulse? What keeps things ticking? What is that momentum that you can build up to go forward? Because if a team feels that it has that momentum, it feels like it can do anything. And that is a key thing of a healthy team, that feeling of, wow, together we can do anything. We can overcome any problem. And that comes from that feeling of momentum. And then that follows on uh, to continuously improving. Now, you'll know about this from the Agile process. Um, I'm sure many of us do it on projects. You have that retrospective every couple of sprints, or may you know, maybe if you're good, every sprint. 
So many projects don't know, and very few agencies do them for themselves. When was the last time you got everybody together and you just did a complete retrospective of how have the last three months gone? What problems have we had? What can we learn from them? When was that time? And if it wasn't recently, when could you schedule it, schedule it for again? Because just like an agile process, you want to continually learn from everybody and have everybody feeding in ideas for improvement, feeding in problems that came up, and continuously improving the organization. Now on this, I'd really recommend a book. Um, it's by the founder of Pixar. Um, and in it, he it's called Creativity Inc. And in it, he describes their notes process. In the creative industry, there's a lot of delicate people, which of course, in, in tech, we're much, much tougher as an industry, aren't we? <laughs> Okay, in work, there's a lot of delicate people. All of us are delicate to some degree. And so giving feedback and asking people to improve is tough. It, it is really tough. So Pixar have developed their notes, process, and principles. And if you Google that, you can find out a bit more as well. But they have a notes day on a regular basis where they get together and do that, not just for the films, but for the way the organization runs. And having a notes day or a notes afternoon, or whatever you can do, will really help to continuously improve your organization. So these are some of the key points that we've considered there. Leadership, purpose, allowing people to be real people, self-managing, set people free, communication constantly, problem solving, expect the problems, welcome the problems, because they are your chance to improve pulse and momentum, and then continuously improving. And I mentioned earlier this concept of, um, if you want to change the organization, be the change. And that's really important, because there'll be people in this room who aren't the CEO of the organization, or aren't the leader of their team. But that doesn't mean that you can't bring about change in your team, in your organization, and steer it towards a healthier approach. Everybody in the organization, as we discussed here, can move to the center at some point, even if they put that hat on themselves quietly and never say, I am now a leader, they could just get people together for a meetup. What if you started getting people together for a you know, better project teams meetup and sharing experiences, and you started filtering out these ideas and other ideas to your organization just through a peer group meetup? It's not you know, a big serious thing but it's a demonstration of leadership to organize that and bring those people together and seed those ideas in the organization. What are the things that you could do in order to make that happen within your team? So, step to the center and take on some leadership mantle. Now, there's a couple of points I want to make in general about organizations that lead to unhealthy culture. Our people are our greatest asset. You hear that said, don't you? Big companies, the chief executive will go to a conference and he'll stand at the front and you know, he'll be making announcements about the quarter and that sort of thing. And yes, I, I want to make clear that our people are our greatest asset. And I hate that. I mean, I just hate that. Assets are stuff that are bought and sold. They're things. You know, it's just terrible. You can't do that. We are creative organizations that come together and work. And we have to realize that this is the way things are now. Our organization or team is simply us, all of us, choosing to work together for a shared purpose. Now, we covered this thing of shared purpose um, uh, a little earlier on, but it is absolutely key. The, there has to be alignment. If you've got one person saying, I want a fancy new house and that's all I care about, and other people saying, we want to build an organization we want to be part of for a long time, things fail, things fall down. You have to get people together for that shared purpose. And um, the choosing word is really important here too, because it's something we have to come to terms with in our industry, is that good talent can move anywhere, at the drop of a hat. People are choosing to work together. And if you don't consider them in what you're doing in your organization, if you don't put them at the heart of decisions, if you don't work openly, transparently, collaboratively with them, they will choose to do something else. 
and they can. That perimeter that I showed around the organization, that circle, that is not a wall. That is not a hard, solid line. It's not a line that cannot be crossed. It's a dotted line. It's temporary. You've brought people together like magnetism to work on something that they believe in, in a way that they believe in. They can choose to be there, and you can appreciate that or not. And if you don't, that circle changes shape and teams move elsewhere. So that's really important. That choosing word and that shared purpose word are absolutely key. So in wrapping up, what I want to say is um, there are sprints on Friday. And there's a lot of things there that are code, traditionally. But it's not all code. And if we're going to build this kind of shared purpose and healthy teams, we A, need to understand what's going on amongst all teams. But we need people there who are interested in the way that teams work and working on those kind of issues. How can we bring together people together around stuff? How can we manage core contributions better or module development? So even if you're not a coder, there will be things that you can do at these sprints, and it's really important to go to those. The other thing to mention is um, there's feedback on the sessions. We want to know what you think of all of the sessions you go to. It's really important for the Drupal Association to know what to schedule in future, year, future years. And as this is the first year of this track, the Being Human track, we really want to know what do you think of the sessions on this. Is this a useful track? Are you learning things to take away? And if you want to follow us on Twitter, we're blogging about a lot of this as well, as we have our journey from very small startup. We're blogging very transparently and openly and sharing a lot of these tools. And I'll share some of these notes and slides as well. So feel free to follow or on the blog or on Twitter. Now, it is uh, half past four. There's 15 minutes left of the session. We have an audience Q&A mic. I can't promise great answers to every question. But we can have a discussion, and we can see who has the great answers in the room. Because that's one of the key things. That center person doesn't have all the answers. They just create the right structure, the right place for the, the magic to happen. That's the key part of their job. So consider me at the center of that circle for now, creating the right space, not providing all the answers. So we have time for some questions. If you'd like to line up on this microphone here, if you have questions you'd like to ask, please feel free, and we can put them out to the room. So I see it. Uh, regarding openness and transparency, what's your opinion about sharing wages, what the staff earns, and, and how much people should, should increase on a yearly basis? What decisions on that doing together with the staff, what's your opinion about that? Yeah. That's a great question, because it comes down to real deep-seated cultural issues a lot of the time, um, and also different laws in different countries um, about opening up that data. Um, we've chosen to be very open with it, and you know, my team members know what I'm paid and what each other's paid, and we like that openness. Um, but we're a relatively small team. Uh, how it works when you scale up is a more difficult question. I've seen salary certainly be a divisive issue before um, when it wasn't uh, opened up uh, at the right times. Um, so yeah, it can be, I think with everything, if you try and put a lid on things, you know, what's the reason we don't want people to know what, <laughs> what people are paid? If your CEO is being paid something that he doesn't want the rest of the company to know about, there should probably be alarm bells ringing there. Um, but how do you do that? Because then how do you explain what the journey is up through pay? And one of the things we've really got to solve in our industry is how do you have career progression in very flat organizations? And so you've got to find other ways for people to be earning more. And that's through their professional development, so they can move on to higher day rates. That's through more specialism, through supporting teams in their specialism. Um, but very often, it's not about moving into management positions or leadership positions, because they're not the right people for those all the time. So how do you, uh, I think it's good to open it up, because it then has, forces that conversation about how are we going to ensure people's professional development takes them up that pay scale without cramming them into jobs that they don't want to do and might not be right for. Um, if you want to read more widely about this, Buffer is famous for having blogged about this very openly. You know, Buffer, the Twitter sharing app. Their blog is great. If you search for Buffer Open Salaries or something, you'll find their blog post. And they share everything. And what they, they have is a formula for the way that salaries are calculated. 
so that it's very open and egalitarian for calculating the stuff. But maybe you, know, you could take a first step, create that formula, which is based on, you know, we will look at market salaries, and we will weight based on experience, and we'll weight based on day rate, and so on. Um, that can be a key thing. Uh, one of the key things I talk about sometimes is the rule of thirds. It's like in restaurants. Um, when you buy a meal, a third of what you pay for the food goes on actual ingredients. A third is on the people that prepare it and bring it to your table. And a third towards goes towards general overheads and profit. So that rule of thirds is in the restaurant trade, and it's a very you know, well-known thing. But in our industry, again, you know, it's roughly about a third that will go on the salaries. A third of people's day rates goes on salaries. A third goes into the organization and professional development and all the tools and so on. And a third to other overheads and uh, profit. So yeah, you can open up a formula, and then maybe that could be a step towards opening up more widely. But I tend to be in favor of being pretty open about it. OK, next question. Hi, it sounds good with the healthy uh, and diverse team, but uh, doesn't it mean that you have to um, say no to talent that you, that you can't bring on to the team if you want to maintain the health and you want to maintain the culture? even though you're talking about diversity. I mean, there's a clash. Or? Yeah, there can be. Um, because talent isn't just about what you can do at the keyboard with code or design or report writing or sales pitch writing or whatever. Talent is kind of a deeper thing that also encompasses your communication skills, your ability to work in teams with others, and so on. And you have to recognize and bring on individuals that are right for that culture in your team. And if they're not, then you have to have that conversation. And it may be that they leave themselves. It may be that you have that conversation and you work out ways that they can try and fit in and, if not, move them out of the organization. But yeah, you will sometimes have to say no to talent. I, I've had to do it. Really talented people who perhaps were very, very lacking on the communication side. And we primarily hire for communication skills. There isn't a member of our team I wouldn't put solo in a meeting with the CEO of an enormous client. Um, that's so important to us, because that ability to communicate with each other, with clients, and so on, is, makes a real difference. So yeah, you, you have to find what is our kind of person. But that is not about their genetic characteristics or anything. It's not about their background or any of that. It's about their skills and their fit with the culture. So you choose on fit with the culture, and everybody has an equal opportunity to try and fit in with that culture. But OK, next question. Would you care to come through to the mic? Because it's, it's uh, being recorded and uh, is going to be put out later on. So we've been asked to bring everyone up to this mic. Although I could go around Jerry Springer style. I mean, that kind of appeals. If you don't track times, how do you then see if a project runs over budget? OK, so um, if you're using Agile, then you're working in sprints. And you know at the end of each sprint the how many client doesn't want Agile. Well, I'd get a different client, <laughs> so, unless it's a very small project. I mean, there are certain small budget projects that it's fine not to use Agile file. But for larger projects, I mean, the UK government published um, a report yesterday. One of their government agencies um, has adopted Agile, and in the last two years, have delivered something like, I'm trying off the top of my head to think, I think it's something like eight successful live projects. And the previous 10 years, they've delivered two that had succeeded. Um, and you know they've just seen this change in momentum and transparency and visibility. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about all about just Scrum. Let's not get religious about it. But it's agile principles about openness, transparency, collaboration, regular you know, check-ins, regular planning, rather than big planning, big delivery, big ah, um, which uh, tended to typify projects before. OK, but like, could you like, say an example? You know, I imagine you have a team of five people. They all work remote. You don't mm -hmm. know what they're doing. Or, well, you see it in a sprint board or whatever, right? Yeah, but sure. You don't know if they spend now four hours on it or eight hours on it. And, you know, and how, what are you then building in the end? I mean, if you want to send a bill, you need to somehow say, OK, we spent X hours on your project, and here's yeah. your bill. So what we do is we work in sprints. And people are booked on to sprints. When a project's starting, it might be sort of you know, 10 two-week sprints or something for a team of five. Um, and at the beginning of that project, you're agreeing the teams and their presence and so on. And at the end of each sprint, all it is is person days. Yeah, okay. 
Um, and so it's a much uh, looser way. If you've got a very short project, hourly is probably going to be what you have to do. But for anything bigger, we encourage this move towards sprint thinking, um, and at the very least, person days. Um, and all that matters is someone was booked on something. It's, you know, it's not something where the client suddenly says, oh, yeah, yeah, our marketing department haven't got the brand guidelines yet. You'll have to send your design guy home. Um, that guy's booked and needs to be booked on something else. Uh, you know, or you know, the API documentation is ready. Your developer will have to go home and she can come back tomorrow. Uh, that doesn't work. You can't do that kind of thing because you have a team approach. So that kind of um, uh, agile process, that kind of sprint base, really helps you get out of that hourly culture, which is punishing for everybody and doesn't deliver real value. And you monitor progress instead through the delivery of story points. And in fact, there's even a culture, there's a really interesting thread. If you look up hash no estimates, and Google it as well, there's a site that supports the hashtag. Um, and there's a really interesting culture around, it's a waste of time to estimate at all. Because, you know, it's always wrong, isn't it? Because we're doing really complex stuff. It's almost impossible to know the solution at the beginning, the entire solution and how long it will take. So recognize that and just try and get things to roughly the same size and study the number of things that go through the system. But if otherwise, if they're different size stories, you can do rough story pointing. And you can then look at the velocity that you deliver through a project. And that helps get that team away from that curse of micromanagement and time tracking. OK, next question. Uh, just wondered if you've got any sort of um, thoughts or advice for, uh, we're a very small company, four people. We've just gone distributed. And um, it's working pretty well with the communications all, you know, um, is, is kind of working well and everything. Um, and we're all generally fairly pleased with it. One um, sort of issue I'm looking for to the future is taking on new members of staff. Um, now we're not we're not a particularly wealthy company, so um, you know we're not going to be we're not going to be in a position to sort of hire venues or anything. So if I was to take on an experienced member of staff, I don't think that would be too much of a problem because they might have worked distributed before. You know, you might have a couple of face to face meetings with them in a cafe, and then away they go. But what about um, somebody inexperienced or a junior or, you know, are there any, anything that I could possibly do? Mm. Um, uh, it's a challenge that all distributed teams face. Um, in fact, it's even a problem in other organisations because, you know, even if you're in the same office, people are busy. They've got their own jobs to do. So bringing in junior staff is something that's often done very badly. Uh, in our industry, it's kind of like, oh, here's your induction day, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Um, you know, here's an email and go to lunch with them. Done. <laughs> you know, um, that kind of thing. And we really need to look at better onboarding for particularly junior staff. Um, but if you're doing that in a distributed environment, I think the face to face time is so valuable to those who are new and young in the industry. And so it could be a question of just pairing them up with someone who lives not too far away. And maybe that pair could meet up in a cafe two days a week um, for the first few weeks. Um, what can you do there? Um, and also, uh, you know, maybe a few of you could meet up once a month or something and just support them through that. Uh, and otherwise, the next best fallback is have someone just have a daily 15-minute hangout with them. How are you doing? What are you are doing there? And checking in with them on chat regularly. You just need to be very present, very active, so that they're not sitting there at home going, mm. Nobody's talking to me. What do I do next? I don't want to make a fool of myself by saying something in the chat. Oh, what do I do? Uh, so you've got to really support them through it, because they, it will be very stressful for them. So do it remotely or in person, however you can. But do it very mindfully. Think of, what are they thinking now? What might they be worrying about? How can we help them through that? There's no perfect answer, though, I'm afraid. Remember that slide with perfection cross out? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for a great session. Uh, we're a Norwegian company with uh, eight, uh, eight, nine people, and we're looking to grow to the double size within the two, three, couple of years. Could you just elaborate on where you were when you started this process, and where you're now, and where you're going in terms of scaling, and how you're going to do that? Sure, yeah. We're a pretty young company, um, and we'd come out of a very difficult situation, but the team you know, um, had gone off in different, you know, um, come from all sorts of different directions, um, uh, but decided to link up. And um, so we started, and on day one, we blogged. So you can look at our blog and just think what we were thinking day one. Um, and we wrote about that kind of stuff. Uh, and we're sharing weekly throughout, uh, throughout the process. So we've got to the stage now uh, where there's 
seven of us, um, and we work together regularly. Uh, we're on, you know, few of us on different projects and so on. So we have to work to actively keep that cohesion, even on such a small team uh, when it's distributed. Um, and we're not going for huge growth. What we're doing is partnering with other agencies to deliver larger projects. And the bit that we specialize in is the kind of the consultancy and the project guidance through a process, sort of a program management approach. And we support a small team of uh, other agencies to deliver very big projects like that by providing that wrapper that allows them to work with enterprise clients. And we're very selective about those partners that we take on so that we know they can deliver those projects. So we'd, we'd, rather than growing really big, what we're seeking to do is get the best in the industry. So rather than be a supermarket, we're a group of local independent traders who are owner-managed, are passionate about what they do, have well-trained, well-supported staff, and so on. And that's kind of a, a different approach that we're taking now. Um, but yeah, that growth is hard. You'll find that getting into double digits is a really tough phase. Um, and then the next thing you'll hit is somewhere around about 30. And we've said we probably don't want to grow beyond about 25 to 30 people because that's the, you know, that makes it easy to just get together regularly and to do things regularly. And you know, um, growing, when you're at that level and if you decide not to grow beyond that, what you do is you look for the higher value product, uh, projects. You look for the better clients. You get more selective. And you put some limit on the organization. And that's a good thing from Agile as well. You've got the concept. Um, in uh, uh, Kanban and so on, of this work in progress limit. Um, and that's really, really helpful in delivering projects. It's also really, really helpful in delivering successful organizations. You look for the highest value thing to do all the time, the best client to work with. You don't just take on every project you can get to grow bigger. And I think it's important to, be, to think about what direction do you want to go? Do you want to be really big, or do you want to be kind of owner-managed, a real team feeling, and consider what the culture is that you want to maintain. But always, I, I favor higher value. Go for the, the higher day rates, go for the projects that are more fun, more exciting. Be selective, reject most RFPs. One of my colleagues yesterday, um, one of our overheard at Convivio things was, for these RFPs, we're going to need to get a bigger bin because we're really selective. <laughs> and there's some really bad RFPs out there that we get sent and so on. So uh, you've just got, when you're small, you can afford to be really selective and just take on things that are absolutely, you remember the three points of focus. Once you've got that figured out, you know you can reject anything that isn't at the triangulation of those. And that will define your organization. Saying no will define what your team is like and what your organization is like. That no is very, very powerful. OK, thank you very much for the question. We have reached the end of our time slot. So I'd just like to say thank you very much. I'm Steve Parks from Convivio. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>